on a number of occasions in the Bible, God refers to children as innocents, I-N-N-O-C-E-N-T-S, innocents. Jeremiah 2.34, also your skirts is found the blood and the lives of the poor, innocents. Jeremiah 19.4, I have filled this place with the blood of the innocents. Now, they were sinful creatures like all of us. Babies aren't, uh, babies aren't perfect. They're not sinless. And if you haven't had one lately, you should have one and you will find that out. <laughs> babies are selfish, aren't they? They want what they want when they want it. And they don't care if you sleep or not. <laughs> the Bible tells us they are born into sin. We inherit the sin nature of Adam all the way down to our present situation. They are sinful creatures just like all of us, but they are not responsible in the same way as those whose sins are willful and premeditated. And God understands the difference. The character of God lays the foundation for the realization that children who cannot understand the gospel are enveloped within the grace and mercy of the Lord. On them, God has a tender heart. On them, his compassion reigns. I read a story about Ashley Irwin, who was slightly amused and slightly alarmed when her young son Wyatt asked her to pull down his Marvel-themed duffel bag, and he told his mom, I've got a big trip tomorrow. At first, Ashley thought her son was talking about church because this was all happening on Saturday night. But Wyatt had bigger goals in mind. He had a higher destination. He told his mom, I'm going to heaven. And that moment, Ashley understood because her husband, Tyler, had passed away almost two years before. And Wyatt missed him desperately. And he was planning a trip to visit his dad, asking no more questions. Ashley handed the duffel bag to her son and allowed him to pack in private. Later, when he was asleep, she went through all the stuff that he had put in his bag, and it was quite an assortment. First was a superhero mask and capes, then a whistle, two baseball gloves and a ball, a collection of foam darts, two wallets, one belonging to Wyatt and the other to his dad. Both wallets were stuffed with family pictures. And last of all, Ashley found a bottle of her husband's cologne tucked deep inside Wyatt's shoe. Wyatt's desire to see his father in heaven raises an interesting and important connection with the subject of the rapture. Namely, what will happen to young children on the day the rapture happens? What will happen to those little ones who are too young to make a decision about eternity when eternity crashes into their world? Does the Bible offer any clarity for parents and grandparents, any hope? Thankfully, there are four solid reasons in scriptures for believing that children who die and children who are living when the rapture occurs will go straight to heaven. Listen up and be encouraged. First of all, the character of God. The Bible is full of information about the nature of God. It tells us about his personality, his attributes. The scripture calls him father. I mean, that's a good place to start. He isn't simply a distant force in the universe. As Jesus put it, he is our father in heaven. And there's a tender passage that describes him in the book of Deuteronomy, tucked in the Old Testament. You wouldn't find it unless you were looking for it, but here's what it says. Do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you saw the Lord your God. He carried you as a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. The Bible teaches us that God is so full of compassion and tenderness and mercy that he carries us through tough places like a father carrying his son when he's no longer able to navigate himself. This is a consistent theme, and if you read the Psalms, you will see it everywhere. If you look for it, it'll jump out at you. Psalm 86, 15 says, But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious and long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. And Psalm 145, verse 9 says, The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all of his works. How many of you know God is a good God? He is a good God, and he's good to all. And that would, that would certainly include children. 
He knows that little children cannot comprehend the truth of the gospel, yet God loves them deeply. He loves the preborn and the newborn. He loves the infant and the toddler. And there are some incidents in the Old Testament that help us wrap our minds around all of this. Put on your thinking cap and join me for just a moment as we try to explore this. When the children of Israel were denied entrance into the promised land because of the unbelief of the people, the children were not held responsible and God allowed them to enter. Do you remember that? Here you see the principle of God applying his grace to those who cannot believe. Here you see God treating children in a unique manner. Deuteronomy 139 says, Moreover, your little ones and your children who you say will be victims who today have no knowledge of good and evil, they will go in. To them I will give the land and they shall possess it. Did you get that? They were defined as children who had no knowledge of good and evil. And they were allowed to go into the promised land even though their parents were disqualified. One of the reasons God gave to Jonah, for instance, for having pity on Nineveh was the huge number of children who lived in the city who could not discern between the right hand and the left. You remember, Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. He didn't like the Ninevites, and you can understand why. They were a cruel bunch, those people. But God said to Jonah, should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 who cannot discern between their right hand and their left? In other words, God understands that there's a special quality about children different than the total population involved in the things that he has said. Did you know that in the Bible the word children is found nearly a hundred times just in the Gospels alone? The Bible teaches that God knows children and that he loves children with special care. Our Heavenly Father in his justice provides for children who are not old enough to comprehend the gospel. In fact, Ezekiel says, Moreover, you took your sons and your daughters whom you bore to me. Words of God. We bore our children to God. These children belong to God. And the character of God provides a special grace for these children who cannot believe. On a number of occasions in the Bible, God refers to children as innocents. I-N-N-O-C-E-N-T-S. Innocents. Jeremiah 2.34, also your skirts is found the blood and the lives of the poor innocents. Jeremiah 19.4, I have filled this place with the blood of the innocents. Now they were sinful creatures like all of us. Babies aren't perfect, but they are not responsible in the same way as those whose sins are willful and premeditated. And God understands the difference. The character of God lays the foundation for the realization that children who cannot understand the gospel are enveloped within the grace and mercy of the Lord. On them, God has a tender heart. Number two is the condition of salvation. There's another reason why children go straight to heaven when they die and why they will be raptured into Jesus' arms if they are living when he comes back. This second reason has to do with the condition for salvation. So let me ask this question. What must a person do to be lost? And the answer is they must refuse the free offer of God's saving grace. That's how you get lost. You hear the gospel, somebody explains it to you, and you refuse it. One writer expresses it this way. Little children have no record of unbelief or evil works. There's no basis for their deserving an eternity apart from God. They are graciously and sovereignly saved by God as a part of the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Isaiah the prophet speaks about such a period in the moral innocence in the life of a child. Isaiah 7, 16 says, Before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Isaiah said there's a time in a child's life before they know how to choose evil and accept good. In the Bible, infants, little children, and any others who cannot believe are neither told to believe nor expected to do so. They are not classified as wicked evildoers and rejectors of God's grace. It's always the adults who are described like that, either directly or indirectly. And so the Bible teaches us that because of the character of God and the condition for salvation, our children are in a special place. But I'm not done. There's two more. The compassion of our Savior. Listen to this. When we read the stories of Jesus in the Gospels, we discover that Jesus had an incredible love for children. Listen to this. 
Matthew 19, 13, and 14. Then little children were brought to Jesus that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them for bringing these children to Jesus. You can see they're Jesus handlers. You know what I mean? Don't let these children mess with Jesus. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. He said, children are the kind of people that are in heaven. Don't, don't keep them away from me. We also have a wonderful passage in Matthew's gospel that is as definitive as any verse in the Bible on the eternal love that Jesus has for children. This is Matthew 18, 14. And here's what it says. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. I put that in big print in my Bible. I underlined it. That's one of the key verses. The Bible says that it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. There you have the strong, unambiguous statement of the Savior. He's not willing that one of these little ones should perish. And if that's all that I had, I'd build my hope on that alone. The Lord Jesus has compassion for little children and infants, and he's not willing that even one of them should perish. Not one. Perhaps this is a good time to answer the question concerning the unborn. What about babies that are never born because of miscarriages or abortions? Listen to me. Because of his mercy, that little one now lost will be waiting for you in heaven. And you will enjoy an eternity of loving fellowship with that precious child. Jesus loves you and he loves every child from conception. In fact, he loves us even before time began. John MacArthur wrote this. He said, I can't imagine that the same Savior who blessed little babies and said of such is the kingdom of heaven secretly intended to deny them that mercy. We know from the character of God, from the condition for salvation, and from the compassion of Jesus that little ones go to heaven when they die. But I've saved the best reason, the best proof of that until last. There is an incident in the life of King David that is fundamental to answering this question. And if I had nothing else to say to you today, I'd go right to this passage in 2 Samuel 12. Let me tell you the story. This section of scripture records the events that happened in the life of David after he was confronted by the prophet Nathan. As you remember, Nathan was appointed by God to confront David concerning his adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband Uriah the Hittite. And when Nathan confronted David, among other things, he told David that the child that he and Bathsheba had brought into the world would be taken away from them in death. And let's pick up our reading of 2 Samuel, and it's really told better in the scripture than I could ever tell you. 2 Samuel 12, 14 to 23. I'm reading the scripture. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, The child also who is born to you, said Nathan, shall surely die. And Nathan departed and went to his house. And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became ill. And David therefore pleaded with God for the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. So the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the ground. But he would not, nor did he eat food with them. And on the seventh day it came to pass that the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him. He would not even listen to us. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do some harm. When David saw that his servants were whispering, he perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said to his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, and changed his clothes, and went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. And he went to his own house, and when he requested, they set food before him, and he ate. And his servant said to him, what is this that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive, But when the child died, you arose and ate food. They couldn't figure it out. And David said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept for I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? 
But now he is dead, and listen to these words. Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. What a tremendous, what a tremendous story that is. The last sentence in that passage is arguably the greatest sentence in the Bible on the subject of what happens to a child when they die or when the rapture happens. It was this thought of a reunion with his dead child which cheered David. But where did he think the reunion would be? In the grave? In hell? In heaven? He believed that he himself, David believed that he himself would go to heaven after death and consequently meant to express the belief that his child had gone on before him to that blessed place. And the idea of meeting his child in the unconscious grave could not have rationally comforted him, nor could the thought of meeting him in hell have cheered his spirit. But the thought of meeting that child in heaven had in itself the power of turning his weeping into joy. What a story. Here's a few things that we have to collect toward the end of this message. What about the age of accountability? People ask you about that. Are little children innocent until they reach a certain age? I mean, is it nine? Is it 11? Is it five? In our attempt to bring comfort to those who mourn, we must not deny the truth of God's word. No one is truly innocent. Jesus' statements about children being innocent doesn't mean that they are without sin. It means that they were not responsible for their sin. The Bible teaches that all of us are sinners. Psalm says it clearly. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. From the beginning, we're all sinners. And Psalm 58.3 says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. There are no exceptions. Nobody is born perfect. All of us are born with a sin nature. Even though we have not yet done anything wrong, our nature is sinful. And every baby needs a savior, just like every adult does. But at what age does a child become responsible for his relationship with God? Is there an age of accountability? Isaiah refers to such a time in the life of the child. Remember he said, before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good. The important thing to remember here is this. The Bible does not make any reference to an age of accountability. And that's not in the Bible, that's that phrase. But there is a time in the life of every child when they are able to understand God's love and when they comprehend what it means to be a sinner. Somebody says, well, okay, how old are children going to be when they're in heaven? That's an interesting question, and I'm not sure I can give you a definitive answer. There are differing views about this, and there's no absolute answer in Scripture. Some believe that when we are in heaven, we'll all be mature in body, mind, and spirit. And the thought is, if babies cannot fully enjoy this life, how could we expect them to fully enjoy eternal life with God? Others hold that children will be allowed to grow up in heaven. That's what I believe. In support of this view is the reference to the conditions in the millennium. If you know prophecy, you know. Let me just give you a little picture. There's the rapture. And there's seven years of tribulation. Jesus comes back in the second advent. And then the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth takes place. The millennium. And the millennium, believe it or not, there's more in the Bible about the millennium than any other subjects written about in the whole Bible. The Bible is full of information of what's going to happen on earth when King Jesus is reigning, David is his vice regent, and this earth is under the control of a righteous king. How about that? Well, during that time, the Bible says in Isaiah, you remember this passage? And a little child shall lead them. The nursing child shall play on the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. In the millennium, there will be children. Dr. J. Vernon McGee, one of my favorite people in all the world, said this, I believe with all my heart that God will raise the little ones such that the mother's arms who have ached for them will have the opportunity of holding them. And the father's hand, which never held the little hand, will be given the privilege. I believe that little ones will grow up in heaven in the care of their earthly parents if they are saved. So you may think your parenting days are over, but when you go to heaven, if you got little ones up there, you're going to have to bring them up, but you have to bring them up in a perfect environment. You don't have to do anything. Just show up. <laughs> Amen. So on the basis of God's character and salvation's condition and Jesus' compassion and David's child, 
I could say with authority that little children, infants, unborns, when they die, they go straight into the arms of Jesus in heaven. There was a family whose baby boy had died, and their little girl came to the mother and asked her where her baby brother had gone, and the mother said to be with Jesus. A few days later, the mother was visiting a friend and said to this friend, I am so grieved to have lost my baby. And the little girl, overhearing her mother, came to her and said, Mama, is something lost when you know where it is? <laughs> of course not, replied the mother. Well, how can baby be lost when he's gone to be with Jesus? He's not lost. Isn't that a wonderful truth to remember? The little ones are in heaven. You know, I, when I got out of seminary, I went to the Haddon Heights Baptist Church in New Jersey to be, I know you're going to laugh at this, the youth pastor and the Christian ed director. And I wasn't there very long before the pastor came to me and he said, I'm going to take a little time off, three or four days, and I want you to be in charge while I'm gone. I wasn't ready to be in charge of anything. And I was deathly afraid that while he was gone, something would happen that I wouldn't know what to do. And I was absolutely right. And the second day he left, I got a call from the secretary, she said, you need to go over, and she told me the name of the couple to their house. Something really tragic has happened. So I went, and uh, when I walked in, they were in tears. Their little girl had died. It was a crib death. We used to have those all the time a long time ago. Remember that? And so I had to go and minister to those people. And I had the funeral for that little one, the first funeral I ever had. And it was the hardest funeral I've ever had in 50 years. Children are not supposed to die before their parents. Someone once told me that a death of a child is like a period in the middle of a sentence. But here's the good news, if, if you can just believe it. Even if that happens, as tragic as it may be, God has got you. He's got your back, he's got your heart, he's got your soul, and he's got your future, and you've got something to look forward to. One day, you will see that little one again. And if you know people that have gone through this struggle, you tell them that, you remind them that, you tell them the story of David, that's the best thing you could ever do. And you let them know that God is a gracious, compassionate, loving God who cares for your children and mine. Can I get a witness? Amen. We don't live in a pure world. We don't live even in a good world. We live in a world where good people can make a difference. But the world in which we live is more opposite to God than it's ever been. And the wickedness of man affected his will. The word translated intent is a word for desire or wishes. He was evil because he wanted to be. And his thoughts refer to his mind and demonstrated that his intellect was polluted by sin. And his heart was infected with the dreaded disease. Everything he did and everything he was was touched and tainted by sin. Genesis 6, 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In Romans 3, 10, it says, there is none righteous, no, not one, none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside and have together become unprofitable. So the passage spoke of the violence of Noah's day. And I don't need to draw a parallel to modern times. How many of you know when your mind is evil, when your heart is evil, violence is always the result. <laughs> Noah's generation like ours was cavalier and careless and corrupted. Here's the last thing about their generation. They were caught off guard. They were caught off guard. They call it Johann's Ark, built by Johann Hubers in 2012. The boat is a reproduction of the vessel that God commanded Noah to construct in the book of Genesis. It's 390 feet long, 75 feet wide. The ship is absolutely huge. It boasts numerous animal stalls, larders, gutters for the disposal of refuse. There's an open amphitheater in the middle of the ship and a series of labyrinthine stairs leading from deck to deck. 
Best of all, this boat actually floats. It is currently in the harbor at Crimpen, a small Dutch town along the Moss River. But the question would certainly be asked by any of us who would know somebody would go to such an expense to build a replica of Noah's Ark. Why did he do it? And his answer is that he wanted to spread God's word in the Netherlands. And he wanted children to come and see and feel the essence of that ship and see the nails and see that what is written in the Bible is really true. Specifically, he wants people to recognize the danger of our current age. I believe we are living in the end times, he says. We're not conscious of it. Somehow people never are. In one of his final messages, Dr. Billy Graham wrote in his Decision magazine, he said the days of Noah are returning to the earth and a catastrophe as great and terrible awaits those who refuse to enter into the ark of salvation, which is Jesus Christ. And of course, Billy Graham was referring to our Lord's message on the Mount of Olives, where he said, but as it was in the days of Noah, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, Jesus says, if you want to know what it's going to be like before I come back, study what it was like before the flood. Very interesting. He did not promise to return when world conditions resembled the days of Abraham. He did not promise to come back when the world conditions resembled the days of Paul. He said, I will come back suddenly during a period of time resembling the days of Noah. So it is important for us to discover what were the days of Noah like. In his book, As It Was in the Days of Noah, Jeff Kinley wrote, Jesus links the historicity of Noah and his ark to the certainty of the coming prophetic events and his return to this planet. How? How does he do that? In what ways will the times parallel the times of Noah? So as we look at this, we're going to notice just four things that will help us understand how we should be alert to the times in which we live. First of all, the days of Noah, the generation of Noah, was a cavalier generation. It says in Matthew 24, For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking and marrying and given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know that till the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now the word that first comes to my mind when I think about it is this was a cavalier generation. A generation that dismissed anything that was serious. Here's old Noah over there hammering away and preaching. Like our Lord Jesus, Noah was both a carpenter and an evangelist and everyone disregarded his message and they thought he was a fool. How long did Noah preach to his generation about salvation from the flood? 120 years. Now I know that when you look back into time, you have to make some adjustments to the time back then and the time now. But I can't imagine preaching for that long or even half that long or even a quarter of that long and nobody responds. You know, let's fast forward to the end of his preaching cycle. Eight people were saved. No one in his family, nobody else even responded. And Jesus said, the days before the rapture will be just like that. People will continue to live as they have always lived in spite of the cataclysmic warnings and predictions. They will focus on the present. They will make plans for the future only to ensure their own comfort. They will not give one thought to the possibilities that the prophets were right about Jesus coming back. Jeff Kinley wrote, the days of Noah give us a sneak preview of things to come, an advanced viewing of humanity in the last days. The generation witnessing the ark's construction was a God-hating breed, and their kind will return again in the end times. Noah's contemporaries ignored heaven's message and its messengers, and they carried on day after day, year after year, century after century, eating, drinking, pursuing relationships, without even the slightest acknowledgement of their creator or a reflection of their responsibility to him. I suppose if I wanted to, I could give you all the statistics about what's happening in our churches, how attendance is not growing, but it's decreasing, how people no longer take the church seriously, 
and no longer respect those who are a part of ministry. I suppose the best thing I could say is if you've ever been to Europe, you're looking at the United States in just a few years, where there's no interest in spiritual things, where the world has become almost totally secular. In Luke's account of the Lord's message on the Mount of Olives, he adds the story of Lot to his illustration. Listen to this. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So what we should expect as we look for the Lord to come is just about what we're experiencing right now. Can I get a witness? I mean, I don't remember ever being in a situation where even things that are considered to be sacred are no longer even respected. So are we living in the days of Noah? Well, keep listening. It becomes more evident that we are. Dr. John Hart wrote that the lifestyles depicted in the days of Noah and Lot are those that have existed in every generation since the earliest days of human history. This implies an emphasis on the normalcy and indifference that takes place prior to the day of the Lord. The illustrations that follow in verses 37 to 39 about two men working in the field and two women grinding at the mill also argue for the focus on normalcy. How can a business as usual attitude exist at the precise time when the 21 judgments of Revelation are about to fall on the earth? Who who could imagine that? The most transparent meaning of the days of Noah is that just as normal but unsuspecting lifestyles existed prior to the sudden judgment of the flood, so normal and unexpecting lifestyles will exist prior to the rapture of the church. The rapture will catch so many people by surprise because they've never given it a thought. They may have heard about it when they were in Sunday school or in church years ago, but they curl their lips when somebody mentions the rapture. So Noah's generation was a cavalier generation. Here's the second thing. It was a careless generation, very careless. We learn something more about the days of Noah from the book of Hebrews. Enlisting the heroes of the faith, here's what the author of Hebrews said about Noah. Listen carefully. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things yet not seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. You see, when God spoke to Noah, the old man believed. He was moved with godly fear, and he was concerned for his family, and his concern and care for the Lord condemned everyone else who was careless with the things of the Lord. Every day that he went to that ark and pounded nails to put it together, people watched and discounted it. They were careless. Noah cared. Everybody else was careless. People who have visited most of America's parks say that Glacier National Park is the most beautiful. A showcase of melting glaciers, breathtaking valleys, alpine meadows, and picturesque lakes in northern Montana. But since the park started keeping records back in 1913, 264 people have died in that park, many of them due to sheer carelessness. John G. Slater was a summer employee of the park in the 1960s, and he recalled that all of the workers were shown a film entitled, The Mountains Don't Care About the Dangers They Might Encounter in Glacier Park. He said the movie didn't make any impact on anyone because he said, I was young enough, I went and saw it, but I thought I was bulletproof, and I found it inconceivable that anything could happen to me. Three summer workers decided to climb one of the mountains close to their rooms, and the three started climbing, but they yielded to the temptation to leave the path and head vertically up the side of the mountain. Suddenly, two of the hikers heard a scream, and they turned just in time to see their friend fall a thousand feet to the rocks below. In the book Death in Glacier Park, supervisors made every effort to impress upon summer employees that Glacier has a wide range of unique hazards, snow bridges, crevices, ledges, But warnings usually go unheeded in the face of peer pressure. And I bet that's what happened during Noah's day. Even if somebody was tempted to listen to Noah, they would talk to their friends. You're not going to listen to that guy. 
You don't really think he's got anything to say that's worthy, do you? So the peer pressure was incredibly focused against listening to anything that Noah would say. Don't you see that today? Even gospel preachers are being marginalized. People that used to have the respect of the community are being pushed to the side and folks are saying, you're not going to listen to him, are you? The problem of carelessness can be seen far beyond Glacier National Park. So many people around us are ignoring the spiritual warning signs because it's inconceivable to them that anything could happen to them. Peter undoubtedly was thinking about what he'd heard from Jesus on the Mount of Olives when he wrote, Scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For this willfully forget that by the word of God, the worlds that then existed perished, being flooded with water. Peter said, in the days just before the end, people will be scoffing. So it will be a generation of people who just, eh, what's the big deal? And careless to the point of not showing any interest. But I think the most telling sign that we are living perhaps, at least on the edge of the days of Noah, is this one. A corrupt generation. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, this is the description of Noah's generation. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their ways on this earth. In that one verse, the word corrupt is in there three times. Genesis 6, 5 says, The wickedness of man was great in the earth, And every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That is the most pregnant verse I think I've ever read. Listen to those terms. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. First of all, the wickedness of man was great. This speaks of its intensity. It was full-blown sin with no regard for the right of God. Secondly, affected every intent of the thoughts of the heart. And thirdly, man was only evil. If a man had to choose between right and wrong, he chose wrong. And finally, he was evil continually. There was no law in the steady storm of his sinning. He lived in sin all the time. I wrote this paragraph to try to help you understand it even better. Let me put it this way. In the days of Noah... It was not just that man's thoughts were evil, but that he intended his thoughts to be evil. And it wasn't that just some of his thoughts were evil, but that every single one of his thoughts were evil. And it wasn't that his thoughts were good some of the time and evil some of the time, but that his thoughts were evil all of the time. Nowhere in the pages of the Bible is there a more graphic description of the doctrine of total depravity. To most people, total depravity is not what it really is. When somebody says, do you believe in total depravity, if you've ever heard that term, you probably think that means people are as bad as they can possibly be. It doesn't mean that at all. Given the finite circumstances of our lives, civil laws and various social and religious restraints, each of us could undoubtedly be much worse than we are. What total depravity is meant to convey is that sin has affected the whole person. Not that everybody is is, as bad as they can be, but everyone is affected in their whole person by sin. No matter who we are, we're born in sin. We inherit Adam's sin. Our hearts are evil. Our minds are evil. Our actions are evil. Our will is evil. Not as evil as they could be, but tainted with the sickness of sin. And in Noah's day, that was it. The Bible says they had vile imaginations. That hasn't changed, has it? But now we have technology to put all those images, even worse ones that you and I can imagine, on screens and instantly transport them to a billion depraved minds with the click of a button. Here's a statistic you'll find hard to believe. Over a third of all internet downloads are related to pornography, and 10% of all viewers are under the age of 12. So what was going on in Noah's day? We've upgraded it to a different way, but we're figuring out a way to do the same thing. We don't live in a pure world. We don't live even in a good world. We live in a world where good people can make a difference. But the world in which we live is more 
opposite to God than it's ever been. And the wickedness of man affected his will. The word translated intent is a word for desire or wishes. He was evil because he wanted to be. And his thoughts refer to his mind and demonstrated that his intellect was polluted by sin. And his heart was infected with the dreaded disease. Everything he did and everything he was was touched and tainted by sin. Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In Romans 3.10 it says, There is none righteous, no, not one, none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside and have together become unprofitable. So the passage spoke of the violence of Noah's day. And I don't need to draw a parallel to modern times. How many of you know when your mind is evil, when your heart is evil, violence is always the result? Noah's generation like ours was cavalier and careless and corrupted. Here's the last thing about their generation. They were caught off guard. They were caught off guard. Matthew 24, 39 says, And they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. There's not going to be a 10-day announcement about the rapture. There's not going to be even an overnight warning. The rapture will come when men have no idea that it's coming. On a day that men think it won't come, it will come. And all those who have lived according to the dictates of their heart, whose intents have been wrong and have decided to mock the message of the gospel, preached by another carpenter and evangelist by the name of Jesus Christ, all of those people will be shocked and they won't know what to do. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a tremendous analogy of what we should expect as we look forward to the rapture. Jesus went on to say in Matthew 24, As the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Can you think of a more vivid way of describing the rapture? I mean, Two people working side by side in a field, one is taken and the other is left. Two women grinding grain, one is taken and the other is left. The word taken here is the Greek word paralambano, and just a few days later, Jesus used that same word in the upper room. He said, if I go away, I will come again and receive, take you away. The meaning is to take to oneself. In other words... Jesus said that during the times resembling those of Noah, he would return and some people would be taken and others would be left behind. People are going to be caught off guard. Look at this entire passage and I want you to notice the first and last sentences. Listen carefully. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, others will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Last sentence. Watch therefore. For you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. We know the Lord is coming. This is not the end of the world, but it is probably the world of the end. We're living in the season when we, how do we know that? Well, we just did a little study. The Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days before the Lord comes back. And we know how it was in the days of Noah. And we're seeing many similarities creeping into our culture and the way of life. It may be 10 years, 20 years. We may not see this in the next generation. But we're always to be ready because the coming of the Lord is an imminent thing. And here we have this incredible picture that reminds us that we should be ready at all times. Are you ready? Here's the answer to that question. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, 
and you know that he has forgiven your sin, you're ready. You say, well, I'm not sure, Pastor Jeremiah, that I agree with everything you have said, and I'm not even sure I believe it. Here's something I need you to know. Truth is not determined to be truth because you believe it. Truth is truth whether you believe it or not. Error is error whether you believe it or not. I've had so many people, I've so, so many people say to me, oh, Dr. Jeremiah, I, I just don't believe these things you're saying because I, my God would never do that. And I tell them, you're absolutely right because your God doesn't exist. You know, you can't, you can't create a God to agree with your opinion. Who does that? Here's the difference. God created us in his image. We don't get to create God in our image. <laughs> That's the whole problem. So, so here, here's what I want to say as we draw this to a conclusion. This is an interesting comparison. Our Lord gave us the clue. He said, let me help you understand what it's going to be like before I return. Go study Noah. The Noah factor. One of the interesting things about the original ark was the fact that it only had one door. My friend and mentor for many years was W.A. Criswell, who's now in heaven, gifted writer and preacher. This is what he wrote. He said, there was not a door above for the birds to come in. There wasn't a little hole in the floor for the humble creatures of the earth to creep in. There wasn't a big door for the elephant to lumber in. There was just one door. And everyone that was saved entered that door. The great eagle swooped out of the blue sky and entered in that door. The little wren hopped to safety through that door. The snail crawled through that door. Noah and his wife, Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their wives all alike entered that one door. Jesus said, I am the door. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Don't let anybody peddle this nonsense to you that there are many ways to go to heaven. You just need to be sincere. A lot of people are sincere. They're just sincerely wrong. And, and you know, your sincerity needs to be measured against the accurate truth of the Bible. The Bible says there's one way. Somebody says to me, well, Pastor Jeremiah, that's not very nice for you to say that you, what you believe is the only way you can go to heaven. I'm not saying that. I'm just telling you that's what the Bible says. The Bible says, Jesus himself, the son of the living God, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. I don't know what you can't do. So there's only one way to safety, only one way to escape the coming judgment, and that's through Christ. He bore our sins on the cross for us, and he bids us to come to him. And when we do... He hears us, and he forgives us, and we can go to heaven. One day, the door to heaven will shut, and there will be no more entrance. Can you imagine the people that were outside of the ark when it started to rain? And as it became apparent that they would not be allowed into the ark, and that they would be lost in the flood, surely they had to remember Noah standing up there by that ark preaching the gospel every day and they punish themselves for their rebellion and Oh,